Today we are going to have a very interesting session and I'm glad that I'm joined by two very wonderful professionals who I've got to know in the recent past and uh, have interacted with and I think it's a real pleasure and honor to have you in this panel and to be moderating such uh, wonderful people and I invite you to to listen and to have your questions ready for this panel because the women that we have with us today are such accomplished professionals and I feel if I were to introduce them and say everything that they have done we'd be here all morning and maybe all afternoon but just so that you know who we have today uh, on my left and on my right I have two uh, accomplished lawyers I'm in the company of learned friends <laughs> So I hope by the end of this day, I can borrow a bit of that and also become a, a learned friend. On my left, I have uh, Phyllis Wakiaga. Uh, Phyllis is uh, the immediate former chief executive of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, uh, where she worked for nine years. She is currently the senior private sector development advisor in rationalization practice at the Tony Blair <coughs> Institute for Global Change. She's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and has a Bachelor of Law and Master's in International Trade and Investment Law from University of Nairobi. She's also a holder of a higher diploma in Human Resource Management, Executive MBA, and is currently finalizing her PhD in Leadership and Governance at the Jomo Kenyatta University. Phyllis is also the chairperson of the Kenya Roads Board, a board member of the Kenya Energy Generating Company, Kenjen, and sits on the board of trustees of USIU and she's been recognized among uh, the Business Daily Top 40, Under 40, Top 10 Kenya Communicators 2017, Top Africa Economic Leaders. Uh, she's also been one of the 2019 most influential people of African descent, Global 100 Under 40. So really guys, we have a very accomplished person and I have not mm -hmm. even told half the story, right? And, uh, but today she's here with us and she's going to share with us her story. So welcome, Phyllis. Thanks a lot, Nathan. And on my right, I have Dr. Hatta, who I, I got to meet last week and had a very good conversation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you for coming. Now, Dr. Hatta is an award-winning author and filmmaker. She's experienced, uh, she's an experienced board director of various companies. She's a former investment banker and executive chair of ARIA Capital Group. She has over 30 years of international management, finance, and board level experience with a consistent track record of building and leading financial service businesses at Citibank, JP Morgan, AIG in London and New York. She serves on major boards. She has lectured and talked in various universities, among them there is uh, McGill University, Strathmore Business School, New York University, Cranfield, and many others. And she has been featured on CNBC, Fox, Bloomberg, and the BBC. And she's the author of the wonderful book, just interacting with her. So many people saying, oh, I've read your book. It's been such an inspiration. And she's, she's here today, and she's brought copies of her book. And the book is The Mountain Within, Leadership Lessons and Inspiration for Your Climb to the Top which was published as a lead title by Mark Grohill, the leader of a multinational and multi-ability team to summit Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, the executive co-producer of the award-winning film, The Mountain Within. So guys, again, we have such an accomplished person here, and she's ready and willing to tell her story. So I want to invite all of you to participate in this uh, panel session as we hear out our panelists, and uh, at some point I'm going to invite some questions from the audience so that we can get to understand what their story is. So thank you, thank you guys for joining us. That is your I'm professional bio, <laughs> and, and it's probably scared some of you, and, and, and me as well, thinking, okay, what am I going to ask all these wonderful people who've been interviewed by BBC and and all these wonderful uh, journalists. But just to uh, help our audience understand who you are, and I'll start with you, Phyllis. Yes. Maybe you can tell us a bit of your background, where you grew up and how you grew up, so that we can see if you're somebody relatable or you came from another <laughs> planet, Phyllis. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and good, good morning. It's still morning to all the young professionals in the room, so I'll do our clarion call. 
Young Professionals Convention 2023, Beyond All Limits. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, it's a privilege and pleasure to be here, um, sitting uh, here at Nairobi Central SDA Church and listening to Moses read out my bio. On a day-to-day -day basis when I come here, I'm a church member, and that's what I've been all my life. I grew up in this church, uh, attended all the classes growing up and, and attending um, Maxwell, saw the old sanctuary, we built this church. So I'm really just a member of the Nairobi Central SDA Church and privileged to have seen a lot of favor and goodness from our God. Uh, beyond that, I'm a wife, uh, happily married to one man who's also a member in the church here, uh, Elder James Wakiaga. I have four children. Uh, the firstborn is uh, 17. I have a 13-year-old, 11, and a four-and-a-half-year-old. So that's, that's who I am. I'm a sibling. I have, my parents went to this church, both my dad and my late mom, so really active in participating in the church uh, over the years that they brought us up and ensuring that we had a Christian upbringing. I come from a family of three. I have two brothers, I'm a middle child. I don't know if I have middle child issues, but I'm a middle child. <laughs> yeah, so um, the only girl, I have a big brother who's one year older than me and a younger brother who's six years younger than me. But I also have many cousins who are like my siblings because we grew up in a very close knit family, uh, spent a lot of time with our cousins from both my mother's and father's side. So there are many people who will tell you I'm Phyllis's sister or I'm Phyllis's brother. They are. We, we grew up in a close-knit family. But beyond that, just someone who's very passionate about the continent of Africa. I claim that I'm a Pan-Africanist. I'm passionate about the fact that we have a lot of resources, which is our people, our natural resources, and we can maximize them to the benefit of our people. And I feel like we are not doing that. So that's my, my passion and, and something I'm, I'm, I'm seeing what we can do more about. And over the years in my professional life, I'm privileged to have played a role in different facets of both private sector and government to do the little I can uh, where, where I can. Um, beyond that, I'm also very passionate about mentorship and about leadership. Um, uh, I ran a, a social enterprise that I registered in 2008 called Tinsight. That is a platform that we use to equip, uh, empower, and transform young people. And it's been the platform I've used to speak in different schools, forums, and uh, this year scaling it up to also bring in career professionals who are starting their career journeys. So that's my passion project for now. Yeah, so that's a brief introduction of who I am. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. So you, you sound like one of us here, yeah, of really. <laughs> Yeah. So you're telling us that you played in these playgrounds yes, yes. and you are a pathfinder yes, yes. and a young professional in this church. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And Dr. Hatta. Yeah, th thank you very much, Moses, for setting this up so beautifully. And Phyllis, it is a privilege to collaborate with you here today. I look out at you and you look so beautiful. Thank you for being here this morning. So let me, let me ask you a question. What questions would you ask from us? Because you are spending your time here. And I would suggest that you should ask at least two questions. Do you have my best interest at heart? Do you care about me? And secondly, can I trust you? Those are the questions that you should ask us. Do you care about me? And can I trust you? And what I'm asking about you, uh, because when I hear people talk about my bio, I, uh, I feel it doesn't tell the story. So what I'm asking about you, for you, from you is, first of all, be present. Put the phones away, put your, block out all the thoughts that bother you and that detract you from being here present this, this morning or it's just about afternoon. So be present. Secondly, spend a moment to be mentally prepared because what we are going to share with you is only going to make a difference if you are mentally prepared to, 
to, to take it in, right? And thirdly, and there's nothing you can do about this, and it was not advertised, but I am German by background, and I am punctual. So when Kate says, I want you here at 8 o'clock this morning, my husband and I waltz through that door at 8 o'clock this morning. Fortunately, we were not alone because I saw two wonderful women coming shortly after us. And Ellen and Lydia, I think it's the two of you, uh, I would like to give you a free copy of my book so as, a, as a reward. <laughs> the rest of you, if you want it, you need, to, you need to make a donation. So I think that's fair, right? <laughs> So, in a, in a nutshell, why, why am I here uh, and why should you care about knowing my background? I think the only reason that you really should know about it is because um, I really genuinely want to make a difference for the kingdom. My husband and I are both ordained elders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist, not playing in these backgrounds, <laughs> not at Maxwell, but I grew up in a German-speaking part of Romania. German, I spoke four languages, by the, well, three languages and the dialect by the time I was four years old, and was confronted at a very early age what it really means to be a follower of Christ. Um, I grew up at the height of communism. If you were a Christian, you were a minority, and being German and being Adventist, that meant you were a minority of a minority of a minority. So I grew up very early on knowing that discipleship costs, that there is a price to discipleship, and following Christ, even if you can't see your path forward, following Christ, following a God who really cares, and who really sees you is worth it. So as we engage here together this morning, regardless of accomplishments, one thing I have learned over the years is that God cares a lot more about who we become, the person you become, the man you become, the woman you become, the professional you become. God cares a lot more about that than what we achieve. Yes, I'm proud of my professional accomplishments. I will not hide them. But I take a lot more pleasure if someone comes to me in the, in the grocery store and says, I've been following you, and you changed my life. And, and I can attest to that. Say, just before we walked in, uh, a young lady just stopped you. You say, I read your book, and it has really changed my life. So it's, it's truly amazing to hear your story, and I want to start with you. I know that uh, you, you're a lawyer by training, and uh, I want you to share with our audience, like, why did you choose that career path? Why did you choose to become a lawyer? <laughs> How many lawyers are in this audience? Let me see you. Steve, I see you. Yes, there are quite a, quite a few. I, I love Steve's voice, but I also know he's a good lawyer, so thank you, thank you so much, and Phyllis, it's great uh, to have you here. Um, I became a lawyer because from the time I was two feet tall, I thought lawyers were great people. And it goes back, let's face it, we are all shaped by our history. We are shaped by our background, uh, and this is really what we, uh, what prompts a lot of us to do what we are doing. To make a very long story short, because we literally, um, as we say here so nicely, time is not on our side, uh, but to make a long story short, um, uh, some of the history students in this room will know that during World War II, everyone knows about the Holocaust, right? Yes. What a lot of people don't know is that Seventh-day Adventists were also put in the same category as the Jews because we were also worshiping on Sabbath. So my grandmother, my mother, my aunt, uh, they were all Seventh-day Adventists. My grandfather was not. He was Lutheran. So uh, during World War II, toward the end of World War II in 1944, the police raided my parents, my grandparents' house. All the Adventist books, all the Christian books were on the coffee table. 
and the police came in, raided the house, took everything, took all the books except for the Bible. The Bible was wide open on the, on the table. And the next thing we know is my mother, who was 14 at the time, my aunt, my grandmother, and a bit of an extended family, they were all hauled off to martial court. And at the time, the, the sentence was 25 years in prison if you were convicted just for worshiping on Sabbath. So when I talk about cost of discipleship, there is a cost to discipleship. And so uh, basically, fast forward, the first team of lawyers that my, that my grandfather, who was quite prosperous, hired, they basically said, you have to deny what you did. You basically have to deny what you did because there is no defense. And uh, even my mother at a very young age of 14 said, well, we can't, we can't do that. We, we, we worshiped, we are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we can't deny that. And then this team of lawyers walked away and said, well, then we can't defend you. So my grandfather then hired another team of lawyers and these lawyers, all they asked was, are you prepared? And are you prepared to go to prison? <laughs> and so they all said, yeah. So there they were, and this, my mother said this team of lawyers came in and they sounded like angels. And they defended my, par my, my mother and my family. And it was very interesting because they were convicted because there was, <laughs> there was no way. I mean, they were caught, so, so to speak, red-handed. They were convicted, but the judge decided to commute the sentence. So they never went to prison. So I grew up with this notion that lawyers are great people. Yes, so yes. that's yes. it. Lawyers are great people. Yes. And, uh, and so I wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was two feet tall. And so from the, a very you. young age, your, your career path was sort of defined. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit different for me. And mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Phyllis. Mm -hmm. Because when I was choosing to be an architect, yes. they brought us the forms uh -huh. to choose when I was in high school. And I, I thought it would be very nice if I introduced myself to girls mm -hmm. and said, hi, <laughs> my name is Moses, I'm an architect. And I thought it would make such an impression. Yes. And that's wow. how I ended up an architect, right? Nice. Now, I don't know about you. How, how did how you did end up in the legal profession? Um, two things shaped my decision to be a lawyer. So my mom was very brilliant when she was in high school and she wanted to be a lawyer. So when she went to select her courses, she was told if she selects law, she wouldn't get a, a husband. So she chose not to do law despite being an A student and did education. Fair enough, in life she later became a psychologist and got her PhD and everything. But that story just stuck me. And I said, what do you mean you can't do law and you'll not get a husband? So it was one of the reasons, probably because <laughs> I, I wanted to do that. But also my personality. I was someone who was very inquisitive and really believed in standing up for others. So standing up for, for people, being a middle child and always trying to debate with my parents and see why you're saying what you're saying. So my personality was another reason. And the last one is my uncle was a judge. Justice Bosiri is my uncle. He's married to my dad's sister. So I grew up just watching him and, and being very curious about the law. So those are some of the things that shaped my decision to be a lawyer. Uh, oh, OK. Well, you all <laughs> saw people and you aspired. Yeah. Well, uh, for me, I learned uh, yes. along the path. In uh -huh. fact, the, the, my first day at university, when I learned what architecture was, yeah. I tried to change course because what I thought it was is what I now know to be civil engineering. Uh, and I tried to change yes. the path uh -huh. uh, until one of uh, the registrars thought, this boy doesn't really know what, what he's he doing. Do. Yeah. And so he held on to my papers until the deadline passed. Yeah. And so I was stuck. But I'm actually glad he did that because I do enjoy it now. Okay. And I think it was the hand of God that uh, that happened. And I'm an architect today. But now I know that you have, you're still not practicing. The both of you, yeah, you're not in, uh, in robes but... and in uh, law courts. How did your career progress from there? Is there a point where you now owned the decision to become a lawyer? Aside of the people that uh, inspired you to become lawyers. Is there a point where you now made a decision that this is what I want to do uh, with my life, professionally that is. I'll start with, uh, with you. Sure, um, I never regretted studying law and, and quite frankly, uh, I passed the bar exam 
before I even finished law school and, and, and so I have never regretted and when kids are actually asking, because I speak a lot at universities as well, when kids are asking me what they, what, what I would advise them to do and often they say, I don't know what I want to do. Some do, some know exactly what they want to do but others don't, and, and so often I say, you know, just go to law school, even if you don't practice law a day in your life, because law school teaches you three things. It teaches you to work under enormous pressure. If you go to a good school, you need to work under enormous pressure. Secondly, it, it teaches you to differentiate between major premise and minor premise. In other words, what is really important mm -hmm. and what is secondary and tertiary. You know, we get so bogged down sometimes, you know, even in marriage or in our relationships, fighting over the little things, yeah. like you know, write, write the proverbial toothpaste and whatever. Who cares, right? Mm. Who cares about these things? Let's focus on what really matters, what is really, really important. It's the same in church. Sometimes when I see what people fight about in church, I think, can we just stop for a second and go to law school, you know, <laughs> and, and differentiate between major <laughs> premise and minor premise? And then the third thing that law school really teaches you is to speak persuasively because this applies to any 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 career any profession you know you if you want to get ahead in life you need to be able to put your point across succinctly thoughtfully with empathy being able to put yourself into the other person's shoes and communicate clearly so that is really the major benefit so for me i practiced law for a while and uh, really under enormous pressure. I mean, I was in the middle of the big deals, the big transatlantic deals, sleeping two hours a night many times. Um, you know, my, we have a wonderful story with my husband um, because right now I'm incredibly organized. So if you come to our house or my office or whatever, I am incredibly organized. But during these days of practicing law, uh, I wasn't so organized. I mean, sometimes I would, as I said, I would sleep two hours a night. And, uh, you know, I would literally go and, and run out of the house and say, uh, and then I couldn't find my belt. And I would turn to my husband and I would say, sweetheart, do you know where my blue belt is? Two seconds later, my husband comes up with the blue belt. The next day, you know, where my red shoes are. I couldn't find my red shoes. Two seconds later, my husband comes up with my red shoes. All of a sudden, this goes on for weeks because I'm not that, that, that astute. This goes on for weeks. Finally, I said to my husband, how come you find all the things that I don't find? And he says, well, we have a three-day bag. And I said, what? A three-day bag? And he says, yeah, if you leave something lying around the house for three days, I'm counting for three days, then it goes in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember looking at my husband and thinking, and this is the guy I love, this is the guy I married, I was livid. And it took us years to start laughing about it, but the pressure was just enormous. Yeah. And, and, but that, that was great experience. And, and I basically decided I'm actually very commercial. Yeah. I am happy to live with my own decisions. If you are a lawyer, you are always advising, right? You are always advising. Um, and I said, I'm quite commercial. I can live with my own decisions. And so I basically transitioned into banking, investment banking. I wanted more control over my life and then became an investment banker, yeah. uh, quit investment banking at the top of my game, and then uh, several years after that started Aria Capital, a company that is specifically focused on Africa and clean and renewable energy. So it's been a very interesting transition mm -hmm. uh, from practicing law to running businesses in large institutions, yeah. and then starting my own business uh, and with, with the support of my husband and that probably is the hardest thing I've ever done, particularly. I love you guys, but Africa is not an easy place to do business. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. And, and I know we, we're going to get into that. It's so interesting you talk about being organized and, and how what you studied has shaped also how you, you behave and how you do things. And coming to you, Phyllis, I, I just want to understand. I know you 
also are probably the same in the way you operate as, as a lawyer, but I want to understand why didn't you drop out of law school and start business like Bill Gates or, or like all these uh, tech people who are dropping out of college and going into business and, and becoming billionaires. Right now I know that you're pursuing your PhD. You've done you know, all manner of courses along the way. Like why are you still seeking knowledge? Uh, first of all, I probably didn't drop out of school because my parents would have probably hung me or something. Mm. So, so of course, because it, at that time, how do you drop out of school? But also because I was passionate about what I was doing. I knew that I wanted to get a degree, go out and work, make a difference. So that kept me going, mm. and that keeps me going until now. I'm someone who's very deep about the pursuit of knowledge. So I always want to learn, I always want to know, I read a lot. I take any opportunity to get into a fellowship, to get into a training. Mm. So it's just part of my passion. Is it important to go to school? I think it's important to go to school because I like what Dr. Hatter said. There are things that come out when you go to school mm. that might not even be what you're taught in class, but what school makes you become. Mm. So that discipline sometimes of learning how to manage your time. For example, I went, I did, apart from my degree, I did everything else when I was married with children. So it meant I had to be very deliberate about how I prioritize my time, who I spend time with, what I major and minor on, mm. because I had to be very, very disciplined. So the fact that you're going to school makes you have to inculcate some of those practices. So mm. sometimes it's not even the knowledge you get, which is important, but the person it makes you become in the process of, of learning. Yeah, and, and my wife is, is here today, <laughs> and I see how much yeah. she does just to keep us organized yes. at home. Now you're pursuing your PhD, yeah. Dr. Hatta, you're writing books, mm. you're running a, a very big business, you guys are doing all those things. How do you find the time to do these things? How do we find the time? Yeah, and uh, I'd like the both of you to, <laughs> to, to tell us, you know, you're a wife, you have children, you have husbands. Yeah. How do you make time to still uh, progress your careers and still have a family and still study? How, how do you manage? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first. I was posing so mm -hmm. that Dr. Hatta goes first because okay. she's, she's more experienced, so she probably has greater tips. But for me, it's been the ability to just remain disciplined. Um, as I've said, I've had to make choices in my life of what to focus on at any given time. Uh, that that has, has, has really helped because sometimes you've had to reduce the amount of time you spend with your friends to focus on family, to focus on what matters. But it starts from the place of knowing what your vision in life is. Mm. So beginning with the end in mind, what do I want? By the time I'm done with my life, what do I want to have achieved or to be remembered for? And for me, I'm very clear about that. I have my vision written out. Mm. I know my ikigai. I know why God has put me here. Yeah. So that limits the amount of conflict I have in terms of prioritizing. So I'm able to prioritize and choose what to do in my time. I also must say I've had a strong social support network, which has been my parents, my siblings, uh, my help even at home who has stayed with me for almost 14, 15 years. Oh. So just having that strong social support system, mm. but also having God at the center of my life. Mm. I, I, try, I say I try and live a centered life, not a balanced life. Because for me, if your center is clear, the other things gravitate around that. So in summary, that's what I would say. Okay, yeah. and what about you? Are they mutually exclusive events, being mm -hmm. a, a family person and also being a career woman? No, not, 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 not at all. And I was listening to Phyllis, uh, you know, talking about being centered. And, um, you know, one of, one of the things that we often, and this has been a, a struggle for me to actually recognize that there is no difference between the secular and the sacred. You know, we all speak English, but quite frankly, these segregations come from the Greeks. You know, so we basically say, okay, that's my business life, that's my church life, that's my family life. Um, and it doesn't work like that. People who are really truly happy and successful are fully integrated. They live fully, fully integrated lives. And, and if, uh, if, you know, to me, um, in business, for example, I don't tell everyone I'm a Seventh-day Adventist when I meet them, right? Um, but I don't want anybody to be surprised when they hear that I'm a, that I'm a person of faith. 
that I'm a follower of Jesus, I really don't want them to be surprised because I want my actions to be fully integrated with, with, with who I am. So it's living a centered life, it's living a fully integrated life, um, knowing that, and I've had to learn this, um, to say no, Learning to say no and, and being very clear about my calling, I cannot, I genuinely cannot help every, everybody. And what stresses me out more than anything else is knowing that I literally can't help everybody. You know, we get requests all the time to help people. And, and there are times I feel so, <laughs> so, so devastated by the fact that, you know, I can't help everybody. But knowing that that's not my job, I'm not God, and I don't have a Messiah complex, mm -hmm. and staying focused and staying disciplined on the calling that God has on my life. Um, but I, to me, the key, and this was an evolution, and it continues to be an evolution, is to really live a fully integrated life. In other words, I'm the same person at home as I am in the office, as I am when I speak here to you, when, you know, we all scrub up really well, but um, that, uh, that, that there is consistency across, across the, that you can see a very clear, clear line. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. You, you mentioned that uh, you don't announce yourself, and uh, you've actually picked words out of my mouth. When I started working mm -hmm. at uh, Tattoo City, I was interviewed by a panel and they said, it has been said to us that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Are you as strict as uh, uh, CJ Maraga? Mm. And I said yes, and the interview was done. Yes. I didn't have to answer any more questions about mm. being a Seventh-day Adventist. Mm. They knew exactly what it meant, that yeah. if I had to sit in the Supreme Court on the Sabbath, you would not. I wouldn't, okay? So, uh, you know, CJ Maraga did the work for me. Mm. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, for, for you, uh, uh, she said mm -hmm. you don't announce yourself, but do you announce yourself when, whenever you're getting into engagements where there might be a conflict with your beliefs? So do you pronounce yourself first, or do you wait for the situation to arise and then you announce yourself? I believe it depends on, on the situation. Uh, take employment, for example. When I was interviewed to join the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, I made it clear from the beginning I would not work on a Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for nine years and never worked on a Sabbath. They used to hold board meetings on Sabbath, they stopped. And they had to adjust to uh, what, 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 what I had done. But it's not every situation where you're asked up front, are you a believer or what is your faith? But what I've always done is any opportunity I have to first of all leave your faith. Because the most important thing is sometimes you have you can be a person of faith, but the way you live can even discourage people to believe in Christianity. How you treat people, sometimes you can be mean to people, you can be inconsiderate, and it becomes something that they see. So I try to be a Christian in who I am, so that I don't have to announce myself. You're the one who would say, there's something different about you, and that would give me an opportunity. But anytime I have an opportunity to speak about my faith, I do it. If it's in a, in a space where, because depending on where you work, certain organizations have policies, like where I am currently, that you don't speak about faith. But in a place like the association, every morning we would pray on Monday mornings and pray. And, you know, you'd get an opportunity to always inject aspects of your faith uh, in, 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 in different things. So it depends on the situation. So, so you did yeah. not... Uh join the organization and say, I don't take tea, please make sure we always have soya, make sure we always have vegetarian diet. I'm not a vegetarian, unfortunately, okay. but yes. <laughs> and, and so I'm curious to know, then how did you make yourselves visible in these organizations where you worked so much that, you know, you, you rose up the ranks, you became CEOs, you became managers. How did you make yourselves visible in these organizations? Maybe I'll start there and, and you know, this, the living, living a fully integrated life in terms of your values, in terms of what you stand for. Um, but in the professions, if someone like Citibank or JP Morgan or whatever hire you, they hire you to do a great job. <laughs> they don't hire you to do sidebars and, and talk to people about your faith. They hire you to do a great job. And uh, I think as Christians, 
we should be known as people of excellence. Uh, I met with, I have had the privilege to meet with heads of state ac uh, across, across the world with royalty and so forth, and that's why, uh, you know, my husband and I are not intimidated by any titles. Uh, and I just find it incredibly in remarkable that we seem to be so enamored of titles. Those titles don't ma matter. If you are not a truly transformational leader, then quite frankly, you can have 10 titles and they don't make any difference. And positional leaders are only going to lead you while they are in that position. So I met with one particular head of state very close to where we are right now. And uh, his entourage wanted to specifically meet on Sabbath afternoon. And he knew I was an Adventist, and, uh, and uh, so, uh, so this is just a little segue to your point about how did you rise. And, uh, and basically, it, it, you get to meet these people generally if they know that you are good at what you do in the first instance. Now, in this case, this is a head of state who has a secret service entourage that's as big as this room. And here is little me, and, and I'm saying to the protocol officer, I'm sorry, I cannot meet with His Excellency until after sunset. And the, the protocol officer turned ashen. He just, his face just turned pale. I could see it under his skin. And he just looked at me and said, Dr. Von Stiegel, uh, let, me, let me come back to you. So he comes back and says, well, actually, His Excellency is willing to wait for you till after sunset. And so I'm literally sitting at State House, and, and the Secret Service people are walking by, the President's son is coming, etc. And we're just sitting there, and we're talking, and in the meantime, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Sunset comes, the protocol officer comes, and says, Dr. Von Stiegel, the president is ready to meet you. And of course, I had my team, and we go in. <laughs> when I walk in, there is the president here, and there must have been at least 20 people again on the other side. Mm -hmm. I had not expected that. There were at least 20 people on the other side, and I thought, God, give me grace, because this is a trial. <laughs> I knew this was not going to, to go well on my own, in my own strength. So sure enough, he looks at me and he says, so Dr. Von Stiegel, I hear you're a fundamentalist. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm fundamental about some things, so it depends what you mean by fundamentalist. To make a long story short, he says, I too am a Christian, so what makes you so different? Why is your faith different from you know, in essence, he almost said, do you make me wait here all afternoon? <laughs> this is not normal. So I basically, and I want you to think about that. If you are called upon to basically say, what is different about you? What is your faith that makes you different? Doctrinally, in terms of your values, in terms of who you are, what would you say? So let me stop there. Wow. So ask yourself those questions and I want you to, to pause and think about yourself also because you're in the stage where a doctor was back then and what are your values, what do you stand for? And just building on to that, Phyllis, you became CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers after working for nine years, I guess, mm -hmm. in the same association. How did you become CEO? And I'm careful to ask a rider to this question. Did you have to befriend anyone? Mm -hmm. You know, you. Uh. <laughs> I know that we always there's there's a, a certain mindset that yeah. we carry, and I think you you you're able to to address okay. that very well. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. But for me, it's what Dr. Hatta has said. Your work speaks for you. It's about your diligence and your hard work. So for the association, I joined them for two years. They were looking actually for a CEO because uh, at that time the CEO was Betty Miner, the former CS of industry. Yes. Her contract was coming to an end and okay. they recruited three people who were sort of like part of the succession plan, myself and two gentlemen. And 
I worked hard for those two years. It made a difference. Uh, when I was the head of policy there, I did a lot of transform transformative things with the judiciary, with the executive. I brought in new ideas. I was outstanding in my work. I scored very highly in my, in my appraisals. And in my relationships with the different stakeholders, we had good working relationships. But a lot of it just stemmed from the fact that I went in as a Christian, knowing that I had to work with diligence, that I had to put in my best foot forward, that I had to use my position or opportunity to make a difference for the world around me and to those around me. So I think that stood out. Yeah. And as I said, I was very clear from the beginning about my faith, and they actually saw that for that period of time, even before I became CEO, that I lived what I spoke. So when the time came to become CEO, I, I got appointed to lead the organization by and, God's and grace. And still yeah. remained morally upright and yes, a good I Christian. Yes, I did not, yeah, I did not have to compromise or yeah. do anything to get the position. Oh, that's, yeah. that's good to hear. And, and is it difficult for women then? Are you, are you competing, like you said, you're, there were other, some two other people who are also being positioned for the succession plan. Is it difficult for you as women in, in a world where most of those organizations have men, do you face any uh, gender issues? Did you feel like you had to work harder as a woman? For sure. Um, but I think maybe talking to the women here for, for, for a moment, uh, the limitations really are in your mind. And uh, there was one good thing about communism, actually two good things. One was the education was second to none. So, uh, you know, you really need good education. Secondly, um, the, the idea that I couldn't do certain things because I'm a woman, that, that just didn't, didn't come across my mind. Until, interestingly enough, I got to the States and I went to our own wonderful Andrews University. So this was the first time I went to an Adventist school. I was just thrilled. I, 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 I just remember the first time we went to chapel and I saw thousands of people walking, walking to Pioneer Memorial Church and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. It was just, to me, it was just, just such, a, such an incredible privilege. But, um, uh, and that, that was the first time that I was really confronted with the fact because my college advisor, uh, I, I told him I want to go to law school, right? So my college advisor actually looks at me and I had a GPA of 3.84. I was at the top of my class and I was going through uni a four year course in two years and, and, and a semester. So I was running through this. And so my, my very own advisor says to me, well, Herta, um, so you want to go to law school? I said, yes. And he looked at me with my GPA and everything, and he said, well, I don't know if you are smart. I know you are hardworking, but I'm not sure you are smart. <laughs> and then he says to me, good Adventist man that he was, he says to me, and by the way, all Adventists who went to law school are no longer in the church. So why would you go to law school? So I remember walking out of that meeting and thinking, well, thank you very much for that. But it made me so determined. I said, listen, one person is not going to stop me. And it was consistent, actually. Throughout my career, there were people who were incredibly supportive, including my husband, you know, who is absolutely my best friend and, and, and uh, our I, you know, our extended family and so forth. But it's, you know, yes, you are scrutinized. And, you know, I was one of the very few female managing directors in, in the city, uh, in, in London and so forth, female managing directors. So yeah, you are being scrutinized all the time. And, uh, and but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think there are tremendous advantages to being a woman because we talk about the challenges as, as women, but we also have tremendous, tremendous advantages. So it really just depends on what you want to focus on and, uh, and make it work, make it work for you. But yeah. one thing that's so important, and I've seen it with particularly highly skilled professionals over the years, female professionals, uh, they become more Catholic than the Pope or you know, more masculine than the men. And quite frankly, you don't, and this is the message I want to give to women here. 
you, you don't have to become like the men, you know, thinking you need to be macho. And, and I, I worked on the trading floor, so people were swearing all the time, and, and women started to swear just like the men and so forth. You know, around me, and I never told a single person, don't swear around me or don't do this, but literally people would come to me and they would swear a blue streak and all of a sudden, oh, Herta, I'm so sorry. I know you don't swear. I'm so sorry. And they would literally put their hands in, in front of their mouths. So you, you be yourself. God has gifted us with amazing, amazing gifts, amazing skills. You can remain feminine. You can look, you know, you can wear pink or whatever you want to wear. Um, be yourself and, and just, just allow that beauty uh, that, that God has gifted us with to, 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 to come out. Thank you. That is so well said. And, and for Phyllis, a friend of mine was saying that... Yeah. It must be easier mm -hmm. for a woman to take risks because you have a backup plan who is your husband. How stereotyped is, is that? <laughs> is, that, is that the case? They say if, if you start a business and it fails, you can go back to your husband. And that is a stereotype, like yeah. you rightly said, that people carry. Yeah. Have you, I mean, just, just. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks that. for that. But just to say that stereotypes exist. Mm. And that's the reality, and those biases exist even in the workplace. So as women, we have to go in our own selves, know that we have no limitations, and not allow those stereotypes or biases to hold us back, because the reality is they are ingrained. I had an interesting conversation with my four-year-old, four-and-a-half-year-old son a few, two weeks ago. Mm. We were sitting in the backyard. My husband was working on his, he's a judge, so he was working on his files, and then he, my son wanted to touch them. So he told him, don't touch my files. My boss will not be happy if you spoil them. So my son asks him, who's your boss? So my husband says, my boss is called uh, CJ Martha Kome. My son busts out laughing and says, you have a lady boss. You don't have a real boss. <laughs> so I was taken aback because I said, this is a four and a half year old. First of all, his mother has sits in positions of leadership, mm. but probably what he watches or what he hears mm. So it was a teachable moment to just explain. But just coming back to the fact that those stereotypes and biases exist and they are a reality in the workplace, but I've never allowed them to hold me back. So I don't walk into a room saying, I'm a woman, I am disadvantaged, these people will do this. I walk in as an equal partner, but I also do not try and become a man because there are certain things or strengths that you have as a woman that a man would never have. You listen better, you have better perception on different issues. Because you're feminine, you're softer in your approach to things. You're able to carry people along more. So you capitalize on the strengths of being a woman, and that eventually becomes very, very valuable. So I, it shouldn't be a limitation. I'm also an only girl, so I grew up with boys, and I never felt like I was a girl, or I was disadvantaged because I was a girl. I used it as a strength. So that's what my, my point of view would be. Can I just build on that yes, for, for a moment? Yeah. Uh, uh, because Phyllis made such an excellent point about knowing knowing your strengths, and and one thing I think that's in, I wish I had known that earlier when I was you know when I was younger, if you will. Um, do you know your IQ is fixed by the time you're 18? Yeah. You're not going to get any smarter. So if your IQ is 150, you're probably going to stay at 150. That doesn't mean you don't learn and you don't get advanced degrees and you don't, you don't expand your knowledge, but your IQ as such is fixed. And you need those skills. You need to be reasonably smart, whether it's street smart or whatever smarts it is, to get a job, to start a business, to whatever. However, your emotional intelligence and the higher you get in organizations, it's assumed that you have a certain intelligence, right? The higher you get in, you, in an organization, then it comes down to what kind of leadership skills do you have? What kind of leader are you? Are you really a transformational leader? And that comes down to your emotional intelligence. And the good news is you can become emo more emotionally intelligent for the rest of your life. So you never stop learning. You, you can learn empathy. You can learn putting into your, yourself into someone else's shoes and so forth. I mean, this is just so important that, that so when we are talking about soft skills, 
these skills are not soft because they hit the bottom line. <laughs> you can't run a successful business no, no. unless you really are, are a, good, a good leader, at least certainly not a sustainable business, right? So knowing that you can learn and become emotionally intelligent, that is true for men and women alike, but women tend to be better when it comes to those so-called soft skills that are actually very hard at the, at the end of the day. And, and I agree with you fully. And also, I remember when we had a conversation with you last week, and you mentioned it today also that it's very difficult to do business in Africa. And uh, I'm sure the same challenges that we face, you have also come yeah. across these challenges. And today, talking about the integrity in the marketplace, have you faced those challenges where, uh, let's talk about needing to bribe someone to get somewhere or to get business? And how do you... How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, there is the temptation to take shortcuts. And young people, one of the things that breaks my heart is when I see people thinking that if I just take shortcuts, if I'm just going to cut the corner here, I'm going to get that money and I'm going to be happy. That's not life. What happens there is simply the devil has you <laughs> and it's going to browbeat you for the rest of your life if you, if, if you, you know. So in, in, my, in my case, uh, uh, I can honestly say no one has ever asked me for a bribe, but that is because I'm absolutely clear about our values. And people know that we are operating completely with clean hands and it just happened this last week. Someone was introduced to me through a business partner. I mean, they had an enormous amount of money to invest. And they said, we have been following your projects. We want to invest in your projects. And here are literally hundreds of millions of dollars. We are happy to write you a check now. And my first question was, where is this money coming from? So while people have never asked directly for a bribe because they know, they know how we operate, we, we have been approached about things like this. But also one thing that we have and, you know, why it is difficult sometimes and frustrating is because we literally, particularly because we are in the energy sector, these projects are incredibly visible. In one situation, we have had to, uh, to, to wait for almost four years till the minister who was blocking us, who wanted a bribe, he basically invited me to a private session, never asked for a bribe, but you could tell what he wanted. Yeah. We, had to, uh, we had to wait for this guy to be removed, and then we could start again. So what does that mean in practice? What it means in practice is if you walk with God, the path is not always easy. <laughs> you know, for, for, for professionals like us, it's, you know, there are a lot, a lot of things that are much easier to make money. This is not about money. This is about calling. And someone asked me the other day, how do you actually, when, do, when are you going to write a book on business and integrity? And I said, I'm actually writing it. It's all in my head. <laughs> and I'm experiencing it. It's all here. Um, but yes, this is the reality. And if, but God sees. And if you don't have the confidence that God sees, God saw Joseph in prison. God saw, I mean, Joseph and Daniel are my favorite, among my favorite ad, uh, um, examples in, in, in the Bible. You know, God sees us. He sees us in the dungeon. He sees us in prison. He sees us in our disappointments. He sees us when people are not dealing with us fairly. God sees, and we have to trust him that he yeah. will reward us in due time. Yeah, and you know, my friend uh, Mark Allen is sitting here in the audience, and when you said 150 million, I saw him think, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it and repent later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 150 million, Phyllis, would you? And you know, yeah. people say, this is Kenya. Yeah. And you know, they say, Hini Kenya. And, and oh you my. can't get anything done without facilitating someone. Do you face those challenges and how do you deal with it? 
Um, you're, you're right. Unfortunately, the world we live in, and especially our country and continent, is full of that. Um, to get government services done, people are having to bribe, to get the deal, to get the contract, all those things are happening. But unfortunately for me, people just say, ah, don't waste your time with Phyllis, you don't even listen to those stories. So I'm known for that. So even having led an organization, I was in camp for nine years, a lot of contracts, we used to do a turnover of over 700 million every year. I never did any deals for all those years. And it's one of those things in the marketplace that I'm known for, unfortunately. It's a good thing, and as you've said, a bad thing, because there are people who then do not want you to be in certain places because it's not good for them. And they know that if you're sitting there, you will not be part of um, either corruption or bribery or such things. But it's not easy, by the way. It's difficult because it's a choice you have to make consciously every day. You'll have conversations and people are, Ay. in fact, last week I had someone tell me, if people were like you in Kenya, there would be no corruption. I'm of, unfortunately, even if you're saying that we are few and far between, I'd rather be the few and far between. Because at the end of the day, God sees, God rewards, and any ill-gotten wealth, at the end of the day, it will not bring you anything. You want the blessings of the Lord that make you rich and bring no sorrow. For me, that's my bottom line. It continues to be, and it's something that I pray for in the long term to continue to be my calling and my bottom line. It's not easy, but it's a journey, I think, as Christians. We have to walk, and when we do it, people see it, and they see the Christ in us. That's what we're talking about, living your Christian values every day. And uh, allow me to ask, uh, because these conversations, we have them all the time, even uh, in different circles, and it's framed in different ways. And people in, uh, in uh, Kikuyu language, say, so somebody gives you business Giving worth, you, uh, you know, a million dollars or, you know, a hundred million, and they facilitated you getting that business. Do you ever go back to say thank you? Let, let me ask it loosely like that. No, I mean, you, you have to be very, very careful because right now if you want to build anything, you need to have a name and you need to protect your name. Uh, the, if, you, if you are in business, you want to be funded by clean money and, and so forth, you go through an excruciating KYC process. You know, you, 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 everything is turned up. And literally, people will hire agencies like Kroll and whatever to do background checks on you and, and, and whatever. So if you are too closely aligned with politicians, if, you are, if, 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 it, if, if there is a whiff of scandal, quite frankly, you don't get funded. You may get funded with dirty money, but you don't get funded with, with clean money. So protecting your name, and I think this is why if you don't protect your name on your journey, you know, because we always say, I want to be on top of the mountain. Well, quite frankly, can you just imagine if, if Joseph had been in the palace when he was 18 years old, you know, and he is in the palace and has all this power and so forth, he would not have been able to handle it. Quite frankly, neither can you or I. We can't handle that power and that money if we have not been faithful in little things along the way. And the end does not justify the means. I have learned that the end just does not justify the means. If you think you can take shortcuts, and but this, what, what we are talking about here, only makes sense, only makes sense if you are grounded in faith. Amen. It makes no sense if you are an unbeliever, if you're an, un an unbeliever out there and you think, you know, live it up because tomorrow I'm going to die, then fine. That's a different lifestyle. Yeah. But if you are living for the kingdom, then this makes sense. Yes, we have about uh, 10 minutes, so we can allow questions from the audience. And uh, I'm sure somebody is going to, to pass me the questions from the, from the audience. And as you are thinking about your questions. I would like for the both of you to tell us, you know, uh, Sean Carter, who some of the people here will know as Jay-Z, mm. said <laughs> that uh, the goal is not to be successful and famous. The goal is to be, to be able to live your life out through your God-given abilities. So for you, what, what is your goal? Because for some of us here, the goal is to be rich. 
and frame us, but for you, what is your goal? And that probably tells us then why you do the things you do, why you will turn down $150 million. What, what is that? What is the goal for you? For me, it's actually quite, quite simple. And my husband and I and in our family with our uh, son and grandchildren and so forth, we, 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 we talk about this. It really comes down to, you know, the, the reference in the book of Acts to David is he fulfilled his purpose in his generation. It's really as simple as that, you know, to actually fulfill God's purpose through, through me in my generation. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but I have a role to play right now. We have a role to play right now as a family, as, as an extended family, and so forth. So fulfilling that purpose, because I do, I genuinely want to see, I want to stand before Jesus, and he can say, well done, good and faithful Hertha. That sounds sanctimonious, but it comes from the heart. And maybe just the last, you know, every morning, I wouldn't dare to leave the house without actually, and I, I mean this, you know, our prayer is always, let me hear of your unfailing love to me in the morning, for I am trusting in you. Show me where to walk, for I've come to you in prayer. Save me from my enemies, Lord. I run to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will for you, are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. And this is a daily journey. Amen. Amen. What do you say? Amen. Amen. And Thanks what about that. you? Uh, for, for me, what I define success as, and I have come to over time, but even when I was younger, it's first of all, knowing your purpose. Just asking God to show you what your purpose is in life. And once that is clear to you, ensuring that you maximize your potential. Because you can have a purpose, but you're living a haphazard life, you're just getting by. I think for God, excellence is at the heart of who he is. So maximizing your potential once you're very clear on your purpose. So if it means that your purpose is going to serve, be the best at that. If it's sweeping, be the best sweeper. If it means you're being a CEO, be the best at it. And then the third one for me that's most important is sowing seeds that benefit others. Because at the end of the day, God did not put us here for ourselves. He put us here to be of service to others. So whether it's your family, how do you ensure that you support your children to achieve their own purpose, to be successful at what they do, to know God? Because I think that's the most critical. I always say the greatest gift my mother gave me was knowing God. Because when you know God, it makes a big difference in who you are. It makes a big difference in how you perceive life. It makes a big difference in what is important because there are certain things that bother people that will never bother you as a Christian. And that knowledge of God is really the beginning of all good things. So for me, it's knowing your purpose, maximizing your potential, and sowing seeds that benefit others at a personal level. That's my definition of success. Thank you. What do you say? And I'm sure you have questions for, for these uh, wonderful people on stage. So I'll take... Uh, uh, three questions at a time. Uh, we have <coughs> only nine minutes, so we cannot take all the questions, but I'll allow some questions starting from, from the gentleman in black. So, so. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation, and congratulations to all of you for your accomplishments. So I have a question that has two parts. First of all, um, when you were starting out in your professional lives, did you envision that you'd be this successful? Uh, was that your intention? And then secondly, um, in your development, have you ever had moments of doubt? Have you failed at any time? Because it's easy for us sitting here to look at you and think, wow, you know, you had it uh, straight all along. Uh, were there times when you were not sure you were going to thrive? Were there times that you failed? Were there times that you almost gave up? Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> a very good question. Let me take two more. Uh, one sitting behind you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm Alvin Mokaya, a leadership coach. 
And one of the things that I'm currently fascinated with is emotional intelligence. Dr. Hara, you talked about that. I would like to know how do you consciously develop emotional intelligence? Because IQ, you said it's, it's, if it's fixed at some point, but we never stop learning. But now for me, I'm really interested in the how to learn emotional intelligence. And if there are some books that you can recommend or some, some particular channels on YouTube or particular websites that you can recommend that can help someone to develop the concept of emotional intelligence. And then uh, to Dr. Phyllis, uh, you've talked about discovering your purpose. So for me, it's the how. That is one of the hardest questions to answer. How do you discover your purpose? And while, while on it, uh, still on you, Dr. Phyllis, um, young people are struggling with employability. So what would you advise, advise a fresh graduate? Because that is really, literally even in church, that's the biggest problem we have. Like you've graduated, you have the papers, you have, you're on top of your class, but getting that job is not that easy. So what do you do with your papers? All right, I think let's, let's try and answer those uh, two questions first. And uh, who wants to go first? You want to? Uh, I mean, I'm respond? happy to take yes. the, the question on failure. It, it's, such a, it's such an excellent question because, no, I did not envision that, you know, I had, I had no idea where the path would lead, to be, to be honest. Um, and, and I'm surprised every day uh, that God has been so good to me and continues to be so good to me. So. Uh, so it, it hasn't been a straight path. And, and, you know, you learn a lot more from your failures than you learn from your successes. Uh, and, uh, yes, when I look back on, on my life, uh, setbacks, uh, I don't actually call them failures uh, because we learn from everything. If, if we learn from something that didn't work out, it was not a failure. Um, and, and I've often been inspired by Edison, who, you know, invited, uh, invented the light bulb. And they had done over a thousand experiments, and he used, and, and the people around him were basically saying, you know, we are failing all the time. And he said, oh, no, 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 we now know a thousand, three hundred ways that don't work. So I think this is so important, and I see it in the, Phyllis touched on this about the culture and the stereotypes. I see it particularly here, much more so in Kenya than in other parts of the world where we have lived. We seem to be so afraid to admit to failure. And I saw it with our house manager, you know, she would break dishes, and all of a sudden the dishes would disappear, and I would say, um, Lucy, what happened to that cup or that saucer? I don't know. And, and I actually had to sit her down and say, you know, I know dishes break. If, if, if I didn't want dishes to break, I would put them in the dishwasher all the time. So don't worry, you know, just, just let's, let's be honest. So admitting to things that don't work and knowing that there is a reason for it and training our children that, that these things are so important, that, that success is not linear. And I want to touch on that because, because so many, particularly university graduates, they are reluctant to take on jobs or roles that are so-called beneath them. Listen, I did Persian rugs when I was in school. I didn't know I would have a future. I learned to work with my hands. And there is nothing beneath you because everything you do, you learn something from it. So it may seem like you're stepping backward, but you're not. You're learning something. So keep failing. But, but I have a whole chapter in my book about failing forward. And I think this is the important part. You know, let's, let's make it count and, and fail, fail forward rather than backward. Yeah, so please get a copy of the book. And Phyllis, uh, did you envision success? I think that was a very good question. Um, I desired success, yeah. so I wanted to be successful and there are things I dreamt about and God put in my heart to desire, so I did. Did I know it would be exactly like this? Not necessarily, and I still think there's 
as, I, as I've said, what success is is not titles or positions. For me, that's, that's really not what success is. It's a good thing because it gives you a platform and it gives you visibility and you're able to either be a witness to others or to encourage and inspire others. But for me, success was about my purpose. I know I did say that for very long I had always said I would be CEO by the time I'm 35, but that was like, you know, something you put as a goal. But it's bigger than that. It's, it's how you really maximize your purpose. And it's a journey for all of us until the grave. It's not something you reach a pinnacle and you're there. Yeah. It's a journey. And even now, um, I've been reading Stephen Covey's last book that he wrote. It's called Living Life in Crescendo and saying that your most important work is always ahead of you. So as long as God keeps us alive, we are still here to make a bigger impact and to do more. And the ability to be able to see how you can continuously live your life in crescendo and not reach a point which is a peak and you're not living anymore. Because as long as we are alive, we live to add value. Um, about emotional intelligence, there are a number of books online. I think if you can Google, there are books, very good books about emotional intelligence. We also have a very good coach on emotional intelligence who's Adventist, Mucha Mulingo. I think a number of you know her. She's yes. a member in Lovington. She trains and coaches on emotional intelligence. And there are a lot of books, YouTube channels. So just be conscious to get the information and see how you can leave it and apply it to your life. I agree with Dr. Hatta that as young people, the employment is not what, uh, when Elder Kidenda spoke, he finished university and he had a job with a car in one week. Mm -hmm. The reality of our generation is that that's not how easy it's going to be because of the challenges of unemployment in the continent. And we didn't have time to give our journeys, but for some of us, I remember the, I, I did practice in a law firm briefly, but I wanted to go into the corporate world. And one of the first jobs I did was at Cop Bank, where we were put in a basement to cut their shareholder checks. And when we went to that job, we were about 15 of us on that first day. By the, by the time we were taken to the basement, some people left. Others never came back the following day. A few of us, maybe five or six, stuck to the very end. And the first job offer I got from a corporate was actually from Cooperative Bank, which I turned down because I got a better offer from KQ the same week. So just be diligent. At that time, it looked humiliating that you're doing that, but we learned something out of it, and we were positive about it. So what I would advise is, uh, you had Elder Kidenda, that let's also not only think that employment is the only thing. We have skills, we have abilities that we can offer to people. And in today's world, there are even jobs online. There's an opportunity for entrepreneurship uh, and, and many other things that we can do. So thinking outside the box. Um, and then the, the issue about discovering your purpose. There are four main things which, when they come together, really become the core of your purpose. One of them is what you're good at. The other one is what you love doing, which is your passion. The other is what you can be paid for, which is your profession. And then, um, yeah, I spoke about your passion, what you love doing. So if you, if, you, if you read about discovering your purpose, one of the books that I read that was useful for that was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And there are exercises where you can, uh, at the end of it, come out with a very clear uh, way forward on what your purpose is. But we can discuss more uh, beyond this conversation. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. I see our time is up and we have a uh, hard stop. Uh, because uh, uh, our panelists also have, uh, are engaged elsewhere. So I'm going to have to end it here by reading from the Bible, Psalm 1, which says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit, in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is a promise from God. And if we follow this, then the Bible promises us that we are going to prosper. So thank you for being a very attentive audience. Uh, I think our panelists have enjoyed talking to you. And I'm just going to give them uh, a minute each to just uh, give a closing remark, and then we are going to end our session here. I'll start uh, with you, Dr. Hatter. Thank you very much. <coughs> I just want to do, uh, you know, speak to you like a mother for, for, for a moment, and, uh, and just, just encourage each one of you um, 
to just walk the walk the talk. Uh, it, transformation never starts with big groups. It starts with a few people. It starts with small groups. If I just look at all of you in this room, if everyone here goes out today and says, I am going to make a difference, I'm going to be excellent at what I do, I'm going to take advantage of every opportunity that God sends my way, I'm going to be grounded in Christ, I'm going to be grounded in my faith, and I'm going to trust God fully, we would transform this nation. And I just want to encourage you, don't wait for the government to do something. Don't wait for someone else to do something. God has uniquely gifted each one of you to do something. And your walk is going to be different than mine. But God is not going to hold me accountable for you, and he's not going to hold you accountable for me. You have to find your own way. So go make a difference and resolve in your heart. Remember, the mountain is within. So transformation starts with you. Transformation starts with each one of us. And the mountain is within. If we conquer that, everything else falls, falls into place. So conquer your own mountain and keep, keep climbing. That's that I can only encourage you in spite of setbacks, in spite of failures, in spite of the difficulties, keep going because the view is worth it. Thank you very much. Do you also want to say your book is available? And yes. You'll be yes. signing a few books? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, if you would like a copy of my book, uh, it's, we make it available at deeply discounted rates for a donation. All the proceeds go to charity. We are supporting quite a few causes at the moment. So, <coughs> but I would encourage you, not because it's my book, but I think if you do want to make a difference, you need to invest in yourself. You need to know that you are worth it and you need to invest in yourself. And this would be a small, a small investment. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Hatta. I'm incredibly honored that I met you, and I'm so glad that we got to do this together. Thank you very much. Phyllis, I'll also give you uh, a few minutes and tell us when you're writing your book. Um, thank you. Yes, the book is in me, yeah? <laughs> as, as Dr. Hatta said. It's been on my to-do list for very long, and I get requests, can we help you write your book? So I'm challenged. I, I do need to sit and write a book. I, I hope I can do it this year. I know I shouldn't be operating on hope, but yes, I will plan and be deliberate about writing a book. Uh, but I just wanted to conclude by encouraging all of us through a verse in Proverbs that let us all trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. Let us acknowledge him in all our ways and he will surely direct our paths. So I know the road ahead is not known for any of us, but as long as we are trusting God and leaning on him, he will direct us and he will ensure that he maximizes our potential in this lifetime. So I wish you all the best, and I'm available for any uh, support that you need across this journey in mentorship, in conversation, and just inspiration and encouragement, and prayer. Asante sana. All right, thank you very much. I think we thank give you. them a round of applause. <laughs> and now I hand it over back to, to our host. Hello. Hello. How many of us are starting to feel the fire burning? We are starting to feel something happening. We want to thank God very much for this panel. I would like to ask you to just sit a bit. And I would like to check in how many people, how many questions have we not answered that we had in the, I think there were a couple of hands. I don't know whether we've taken all the questions. That we still have one, two, three, about four questions, and we would like to, I know we have a bit of pressure, one of the panelists needs to leave, but I believe that, um, So um, if you can indulge us just for a few minutes, we are asking the panel to just 
We will take all the questions, then the panel will handle all of them together before pastor comes up to give our appreciation, a word of appreciation for the panel. So please, as AYPs, let's just move quickly, ask your question. I have this other mic, it could go on the other side as well. Thank you, my name is Juri Sobuya. I'm, I'm in a private sector as a contractor. I wanted to ask that, uh, is it uh, sinful to buy or pay for a job that you are qualified for? Hi, how are you? Hi, Phyllis, and hi, Dr. Hatta. My question is, how do you, you can hear me, oh, sorry. My question is, how do you navigate mentorship and networking as you're growing in your career? How do you navigate mentorship and networking? Good morning, my name is Jared. Uh, I run a company for cleaning services. Question, two questions. One. Number one, um, how do you do a tender when the person being given a tender number one probably has been predetermined, had been known already, or the person going to be given the tender has given a bribe, yet you're giving out the tender. Number two, um, Some of us uh, has got a platform from when they were young up to the time they get, uh, they get job. Uh, the, the timeline has been well. But there are people that has no opportunity of such nature. Uh, when they, they, do, they can't even finish campus or college. They can't even finish um, high school. How do you encourage such a person? Because they also need to live. They also need to strive. They also need to... to get wrong from one point to another. So how do you encourage such a person that he didn't get, he or she didn't get the opportunity to, to finish, though he wanted or she wanted to finish? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, two question. Uh, I know during your growth in uh, corporate world, you face discouragement. So how do you deal with the discouragement either from your friends or everyone who discourage you in your growth? Secondly, some of the hindrance to your growth, how did you deal with them? Good afternoon. Uh, my question, uh, are we, do you need a minute? Yes. Hello, my name is Brian. Um, I have two questions for Dr. Hatta. I, I saw you, you made a film. I'm really enthusiastic about film and, and telling a story through a lens. My question would be, how do you navigate the film industry in an Adventist perspective, knowing directors like James Cameron who made the Avatar movie, how do you tell stories without um, provoking or bending, again, their values, but how do you navigate the film industry and make a name for yourself telling stories about Christ and perspectives from Bibles? And then you mentioned something about school. Is school necessary? Uh, my question is, do you need to really go to, to school for film uh, with the stereotypes around that you can teach yourself and go around working a few things here and there, but how do you navigate that? Thank you. Oh, oh thank you so much. Um, my questions, uh, two questions. Uh, I know during your growth in your career, you faced discouragements. So how did you navigate or deal with discouragements in your growth? Second was, uh, how do you deal with the hindrance um, where you face hindrance uh, as you grow in your leadership uh, uh, skill. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, my question, I have about three questions. Uh, one is how do you navigate the 
well, mental health and having, whether that would be anxiety or depression um, on your, in your day to day and showing up still, even when there's difficult days. That's the first. The second is, what are indicators to transition in your career? You'd mentioned you'd pivoted from when you were an investment banker and were at your peak. Uh, so what did you feel inclined you towards making a shift? And then the last is, how, can, how, do, how do you challenge stereotypes from home? That is generally, well, the home is general. This is in terms of family um, and having those conversations that uh, empower both male and female roles. Okay. Uh, my name is Felix. I'm an HR uh, professional. Uh, my question go is through uh, finance, family, and uh, career growth. So how do you advise the young people in this uh, forum? How you manage your finances, assuming you've grown to the ladder of the career, you become top, you have, a fam you have a husband there, or you have a wife there. Is your money, your money, or my money, our money? And also, does it affect respect in the family if one of the partners has grown through the career? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for, for your questions. I see we have about eight or nine questions. So I'll allow our panelists to just take the questions in whichever, or whichever questions you feel uh, you want to answer. And so Dr. Hatta, you can, you can go first. Sure. Uh, I'll take the, sorry, we were struggling to hear some of the, some of the questions. So, uh, Forgive me if I'm not answering exactly what you were asking, but the question about mentorship, um, quite frankly, mentorship to my mind is a 360. We always think of mentorship that, uh, you know, I, uh, I am mentoring somebody who is younger than me or I'm being mentored by somebody who is senior, senior to me. Mentorship really has, is, is, is much more, to me, it's much more comprehensive than that. Um, yes, if you are aspiring to have a certain career, for example, having a career coach or someone who can mentor you from a career point of view, that is very important. Um, I have multiple mentors for different purposes. And uh, one thing, if you, uh, if you do want mentorship, I would just ask you, please, if you want time with somebody, don't waste that time. If someone is coming to me and says, Hert, I want, I want you to mentor me. I want to know exactly why you want that. I want you to come with a list of questions. I want you to come with having read what is in the public domain and saying, this is why I would like, to, I would like your mentorship. People who have achieved a lot, they have a lot to give. But they don't, and I speak for myself here, probably this is controversial, but you look at people like John Maxwell, for example. He was mentored by some of the best people out there. But the only reason he was mentored by the best people out there was because he respected them. And he came prepared. So if you want mentorship, Make sure you're prepared. Make sure you know what you want and what you want from that person. Mentorship is 360. Uh, I am mentored by people who are much younger than I am because quite frankly, you guys know a lot more about IT, you know a lot more about social media and so forth, things that I'm not good at and I need to be mentored by people who know, who have skills. So mentorship, think about it as a 360. Uh, this is what has helped me and continues to help me think about it as a program and if you are seeking out certain people who you would be tempted to put on a pedestal that they want to that you want them to mentor you make sure that you don't waste their time that sounds harsh 
but it's very, very important. And, uh, and to be very, very clear why you want that mentorship. So that is, that is one, one question I'm happy to take. And then maybe quickly, okay. do you want on the film? Yes. Yes. The gentleman in the back had a question about, yes, uh, actually, I never wanted to write a book. <laughs> so when, when my husband and I took this group of disabled and non-disabled climbers up Kilimanjaro, I wanted to make a film. I wanted to produce a film that would actually show the journey, that would show that everyone is enabled somehow and that everyone is entitled to their dreams and that we can do a lot more together than any one of us separately. So that's what I wanted to convey in the film. Uh, we've been incredibly fortunate. My husband and I co-produced it. It's an award-winning film. It has won multiple awards and uh, it is available out there and we didn't bring any copies today, but, uh, but it has won best documentary and so forth. It is really important to your point that the, the, the films that we are making and that we are willing to sponsor and so forth actually tell stories about real values. And, uh, and so, yes, I think the, there, are, there are real opportunities in the, in the film industry, but you do need, to, you need some money to, to, to do it. Um, but that's, that's how it started, and then the book was, was an afterthought. So, um, yes, there, are, there is some amazing work that, that can be done through film. So if that's your field, um, then do please seek people out, because uh, I think the opportunities are enormous. The impact, the opportunities for impact. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm glad, <coughs> excuse me. I'm glad you talked about mentorship and, and how you better went about uh, doing your film and book. And Phyllis, you want to take um, a couple of questions? I'll just do a quick fire. Yeah, Is it sinful to pay for a job you qualify for? If it's a bribe, it's sinful and it's unlawful. Um, <laughs> the issue on tenders, I didn't hear the question clearly, but if it's about corruption, I think we spoke about yes. issues and those situations because you'll get into them a lot. It's the difficult position to take, but in the long run, God sees and, and rewards you for taking those hard calls. Um, there was something about uh, transitioning from one career to another. This one was a written question. Yes, you can transition from a career to another, but just make sure you know the why, why you want to transition. Do a career assessment to understand what your strengths are, your skills, what you will need to move into that new career. So probably speak to people in the career network. If you need to go back to school and gain the skills that you'll require for the for the new career and just research widely. I had a question Phyllis, on mental let health. Me, let me yes, just yeah. interject there, if I, if I may, for just a moment, yeah. because this is such an important point. Because you look at our lives, and you know, we started as lawyers, we became you know, CEOs, and, and, and in my case, bankers, and so forth. I actually transitioned from law into banking by going into Citibank in my field. I became senior tax counsel for Europe and global markets. But when I wanted to switch to investment banking to actually run a PNL to to build a business, I did it within Citibank because everyone knew me. So if you want to transition from one from one field to another, you need sponsors. Uh, and I know sponsors kind of has a negative connotation in, in, in yeah. I know in Nigeria it does. I, I, I'm not, I'm same, I'm not sure, here. is it the same is here? Same Yo, sorry, yeah. good people. Not but when, I, when I'm talking about sponsors, it is in the, in the most professional sense, which is basically you need someone, and this is true if you want to serve on a board or whatever, when someone has to be there who says, Herta can do the job. She may be untried and tested in this particular area, but I can vouch for her, she can do her job. So you need people like that in your life. So if you're going to transition from one, from one space to the next, do it, if you can, in a space where you have people who can vouch for you. Thank you. you I had something finish? around yes. mental health. I didn't hear the question clearly, but there was, there was something around mental health. But increasingly, I've I've come to understand and appreciate the Sabbath because it's actually a central part of mental health. Because the challenge with careers is sometimes you get wound up and you want to work 24-7, 365, it can't happen. And why the Sabbath is important, it gives us a reason to pause. But more than anything, it helps us know 
that that job or that whatever you're doing is not the most important thing in life. So for our mental health, I believe staying connected to God is one thing, but also seeking help where we have challenges. There's nothing wrong with going to therapy. So if you have challenges, seeing, seeing a psychologist, seeing a counselor in the church, those who exist also, I think that adds a lot of value. I had something on money in the family. I didn't hear it clearly. I don't know if you, if you did. Yeah, yeah I'll just was, take the question. You make money and so. you have, I mean, you're, you're married. Yes. So is it your money oh. or is it corporate money at the uh, house level? <laughs> of course it's corporate we, money. We, yeah. don't, we don't think of it like that, quite, quite frankly. I mean, early, early on in, in our marriage, um, you know, <laughs> you talk about setbacks and failures, right? Early on in our marriage, I mean, I came from a background where we had lost everything. Literally, the communists took everything. So I grew up, th you know, with my parents saying, well, we used to own this and we owned that and so forth. So when Hans and I got married, one of the things that gave me a sense of identity was to have our own house. And I had just graduated from law school. To make a long story short, I knew we could buy this house. And Hans is more risk adverse than I am, and he thought we couldn't afford it. So I had done the budget, I knew we could afford it, and I said to him, I want that house. And he, being a good husband, he said, okay. And if you pay for it. So we had separate bank accounts. You know, it was the most miserable thing. I never enjoyed that house for a day. Um, the point being, if, you know, I, we, we learned very early on, it's not his money or my money, it is our money, we make joint decisions, we, we work together, so no, in our case, but obviously you need a relationship that functions. You know, that's the, that's the key, you know, if you, if, if you have a spouse who leaves you destitute, then you need to make different decisions. So here we are talking about relationships that, that, that function. So that's, that's uh, and maybe just to take the, the segue here about male-female uh, uh, partnerships. For things to work, I think sometimes we, we don't focus enough on the fact that male and female were created in the image of God, and that, that we should be striving for really true partnerships. Um, when we look at the Godhead, because we were created in the image of God, when we look at the Godhead, we are not saying Jesus is more important, or the Father is more important, or the Holy Spirit is more important. It is, it is a Godhead that functions. It's the same in a, in, in a marriage. It's the same in a female-male relationship. You know, we are partners. We are working together. And that's what we should be, that's what we should be striving for. Yeah. Everything else is, quite frankly, it's diabolical. And, uh, and it goes back to Satan not wanting us to reach the potential that God has created us for. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are many other questions that will be answered in uh, later sessions, so it does not end here. And I just want to thank the panelists once again for being very kind and being very resourceful. Uh, we truly appreciate your time and your presence. May the Lord bless you and continue to expand and increase you. Thank you, our host. I'm going to hand over back to you now. Thank you.